really a great pleasure to be here to uh, talk about uh, our work and our current thoughts on targeted protein degradation. Um, you know, our lab actually is a structural biology lab, and um, part of our research really focus on these CRL E3s. Uh, early on, we were interested in the assembly of these E3 ligases and basically the general architecture of these uh, complexes. And then later on, we become more and more interested in how these E3 ligases recognize substrates and how they're regulated, uh, how could they achieve substrate specificity, and then how we could actually manipulate substrate specificity uh, through chemical matter, uh, chemical matters. And uh, I, I want to first uh, uh, to show you one slide. Is uh, This was a structure that uh, I was uh, involved in determining uh, back as a postdoc fellow, and that was a collaboration between Nikola Pavlovich lab uh, with actually Pagano's lab, and I think you have already heard of the uh, P27 that was introduced by Avram, and uh, this is the very first time we got uh, a structured glimpse of the entire SCF complex built upon uh, overlapping subcomplexes we were able to solve back then using crystallography, and of course, uh, after we saw this complex, uh, there are a lot of burning questions in the field. Uh, and I would say that uh, our later study really focused on this portion of this complex. Here you have P27 uh, presenting a, or represented by a short linear motif in this monophosphorylated form that's recognized by SKIP2, that's studied by Michele and together with Avran, and with the help of adapter protein called CKS1. And back then, and I think you can almost sense from uh, the talk that's presented by the two of them, that uh, there seems to be a wide belief that most of the substrates of these E3 ligases are modified by phosphorylation before they gain high affinity to the substrate. And this structure actually echoes yet a simultaneously determined structure by Pavlovich lab where beta-TRCP, another F-box protein, recognized beta-catenine, again, through this uh, short linear motif uh, that's double phosphorylated on two serine sites, and this is also actually extensively studied in the Pagano lab. Um, so we actually uh, uh, established our lab with these all already published, and uh, our early contribution to the field was to actually uh, solve the structure of a protein called DDB1, which uh, we validated or maybe demonstrated to act like the adapter of this CRL4 machinery. And we saw that uh, in the literature there's a viral protein uh, called SV5V protein that actually has been reported to hijack this machinery to degrade otherwise very stable uh, stats proteins, uh, which are the signal transducers in the interferon pathway in order to achieve antiviral uh, effects. And we thought this viral protein most likely mimic the action of uh, endogenous substrate receptors of this machinery that was missing back then. And we actually collaborated with uh, uh, Randy Moon's lab in our department. Uh, using proteomic approach, we're able to pull down a whole bunch of proteins that have WD uh, repeats uh, embedded in their sequence and we named them uh, DCAFs together with Wade Harbor's group who uh, made the same funding. And of course, uh, you know, somewhere here, or maybe not even here, or it's a DCAF 15 or Umbra 1. And then down here, where back then we had no idea what this protein was doing. This is the famous Cerebron that becomes highly relevant later on. Uh, but this is a, basically a study, early study our lab did using structural biology approach to delineate uh, the missing fourth or maybe fifth uh, um, CRL complex in the field. Uh, but really, again, I was telling you that uh, our main focus was on the substrate E3 recognition uh, mechanism. And we realized that in the literature, even though many substrates are modified before they gain high affinity to the substrate, uh, to the E3 ligase, uh, there are examples where the substrate doesn't have to be phosphorylated or modified by post translational modification. And here's an example of uh, a rather recent study we did. We show that a uh, very simple diglycine CN 
motif at the extreme C terminal site of a, of a polypeptide as a product of early, abnormal early termination that can be recognized by a substrate receptor called CalchDC2 uh, in the CRL2 machinery. So this, in this example, uh, the C terminal tail is exposed due to abnormal processing of the, or, or process of translation, and that leads to a protein quality control mechanism to eliminate the substrate. So then are all substrates uh, actually uh, recognized uh, by E3 ligase through this kind of short linear motif in the primary sequence? The answer is not. Actually, again, in collaboration with uh, Pagano's group and uh, really inspired by uh, uh, studies uh, that was actually done elegantly by Luca Bussino in the audience, uh, we actually were become interested in this uh, FBOX protein, FBXL3, which plays a role in degrading cryptochrome, which are the central players in circadian clock. And here I hope you can appreciate that uh, the uh, substrate protein cryptochrome is a globular protein, and it doesn't have a short linear motif that's recognized by the FBOX protein. Instead, the FBOX protein actually, this leucine rich repeat domain, wrap around the entire half of the uh, one side of the globular domain. And at the same time, actually, it's a short linear motif from the FBOX protein itself inserted into the uh, deep in central pocket of this substrate protein, uh, which actually is known to bind to FAD. And at the same time, they actually occupy the same site where the obligated binding partner of cryptochrome cut period is interacting with. And so this actually allowed uh, both a metabolic cofactor and obligated binding partner to regulate this uh, uh, substrate E3 interaction. Uh, we later, uh, in recent years, uh, stumbled upon yet another FBOX protein, FBXL5, where the substrate also is recognized uh, through a globular surface uh, instead of a short linear motif. Uh, in this case, FBXL5 is known to degrade a central player uh, called IRP protein, uh, iron responsive protein, uh, in the iron homeostasis uh, pathway. And in this case, you can see the IRP2 protein uh, adopt a very large uh, globular fold, and that's actually recognized at one side by the FBXL5 protein. And remarkably, in the literature, it's known that FBXL5 would only recognize IRP2 when there's enough iron or when the cell has enough oxygen. And it wasn't known what is the mechanism that conferred this iron and oxygen sensitivity to FBXL5's function. Um, by serendipity, we actually discovered this FBXL5 actually sports an iron sulfur cluster near the surface or near the interface between the substrate and E3 uh, interface. And this iron sulfur cluster is absolutely required for this FBXL5 to recognize its substrate. Um, and it has to be in the oxidized form. That's why you need oxygen to sort of activate this E3 ligase. And in that sense, actually, a single electron is dictating this interaction. And that's sort of a partially answer maybe the question Dr. Lin raised early on. What regulates E3 ligase? Here's the example. Oxygen and iron regulate the E3 ligase by itself, okay? So this actually, these two examples sort of transformed our understanding of substrate doesn't have to be recognized through a short linear motif in the post-translation modification dependent manner, but you have actually more complex surface of a substrate that can help E3 ligase to achieve high specificity. But recently, actually, Michele, in collaboration with Michele's lab, we actually stumbled upon yet another uh, fascinating system where now the substrate is recognized through its quaternary structure, not only tertiary structure. So this is an unpublished uh, uh, results. And Michele's lab actually identified, uh, published a paper early on on FBXL, FBXL22 as E3 ligase recognized or degrading BAH1. And we determined the structure of this complex and showing that BAH1 contains this N-terminal BTB domain that form a homodimer. And the diagram, so to speak, uh, that's embedded in BAC1, is actually represented by this interface between the homodimeric BTB domain. And this uh, alpha helix beta strand constitutes 
the surface that's recognized by FBXL2. So now you have to have oligomer, olig oligomer of substrate that can uh, present the proper surface for F-box protein to recognize. And even more fascinating is uh, we realize that uh, BAC1, of course, is a transcription repressor in oxidative stress response pathway. And in the context of certain oxidative stress, actually this diagram has uh, two conserved cysteine residues that can be modified by oxidative stress. And if these two cysteine residues are modified, it will perturb the local structure, thereby uh, allowing BAC1 to evade the recognition of IPXL22. But then BAC1 is still degraded uh, in response to oxidative stress, even though these two cysteines are modified. Why is that? It's because there's yet another FBOX protein, FBXL17, that can kick in. Uh, FBXL17 doesn't recognize uh, this, this diagram, but FBXL17 actually recognize or maybe interrogate the structure integrity of this uh, BDB homodimeric assembly. In other words, actually, if this assembly is weakened or if the protein-protein interaction is weakened, uh, actually we found that two copies of FBXL17 uh, together with the rest of the SCF machinery would be engaged with the BDB domain of Bach one and then remodel it, separate the two copies of BDB domain, and then form very stable monomeric complex in order to pr promote the degradation. So in this case, the diagram now is actually elevated to perhaps a fourth dimension. This fourth dimension is the structure integrity of a protein complex, but not necessarily the surface of a, uh, of a quaternary structure. Okay. So I hope actually uh, just by this uh, short introduction, I can show you using structural biology, we actually could understand how substrates are generally recognized by E3 legacies uh, through the primary sequence in the form of short linear motif, either modified or not modified, or the, the tertiary structure fold that's presented by globular domains of the substrate. But now we actually found uh, the landscape of uh, diagram is even more complex it can be actually embedded in the quaternary structure of the substrate. And even further on, it can be the stability of the quaternary structure that are the signature motif that's recognized by uh, FBXL, um, in this case, FBXL17. So um, I think along the way, we also found other cellular factors, oxidative stress, oxygen level, iron availability, all these uh, um, endogenous or exogenous signals can actually come to play to regulate this interaction uh, in a way that explains the complexity of biology, but at, at the same time perhaps also present additional opportunities for us to come up with therapeutic compounds to manipulate these interactions. Uh, of course, I want to highlight that uh, all these uh, studies, uh, we are just the structural biologists, uh, and it really relies on organic and intimate collaboration between us and multiple groups around the nation, if not the, 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 the planet, uh, to make sure that uh, we are on the right path. But perhaps among all these uh, studies, uh, our most unique contribution to the field is the uh, mechanism of action of oxygen, uh, which is a natural plant hormone that regulates every aspect of plant biology. And its discovery can be traced way back to Darwin uh, who actually suggested the existence of this molecule in phototropism. Uh, later on, it was identified as a very simple tryptophan derivative, uh, chemically known as indo-3-acetic acid, that actually uh, foster interaction between the f box protein found in plants, uh, already uh, introduced by Michele. And, and in the presence of oxygen, these transcription factors or transcription repressors called oxyas can be recognized by tier one and degraded thereby altering transcription program. And we actually used crystallography again many years ago before cryo-EM revolution happened to determine this uh, very fascinating complex uh, showing that oh, by serendipity we discovered inositophosphate uh, in the middle of this protein. But really our structure reveals how the diagram uh, oxyA in oxyA is recognized by FPXL, uh, sorry, tier one protein in the presence of auxin. And auxin literally sit in between two proteins, fill up a gap, 
uh, to extend the protein-protein interaction and then enhance uh, their binding. Uh, what we realized back then is that auxin is not a uh, allosteric switch, which usually, let's say, a ligand binds to GPCR, alter conformation of the GPCR, allow GPCR to do something. It's not, it's not doing that because we solved the structure of ligand and ligand, ligand bound and ligand free form of tier one uh, with, without auxin, and we don't see any conformational changes. Uh, auxin is also not a protac uh, by functional molecule that was uh, mentioned by uh, Michele, and it was, uh, you know, the concept was uh, developed by uh, Craig Cruz and uh, Rita Chase early on before this uh, structure was reported. Uh, it's not a bifunctional molecule, but instead a very simple compound that's uh, pretty much like a tryptophan amino acid sitting at the protein-protein interface. So we had to uh, come up with a new term called molecular glue to explain auxin's mechanism of action. And of course, needlessly to say that uh, uh, sort of reflecting how fast science progress, uh, in three years, uh, Ito et al. at the Hirashi Honda's lab actually reported the target of the thalidomide, and, uh, uh, or its um, derivatives collectively known as emids. And then thanks to groundbreaking studies uh, from Brian Ebert's lab and Bill Kalin's lab from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, they identified the target of uh, thalidomide uh, uh, it, while, uh, while it's uh, reprogramming cerebellum. So here we have the first example of uh, molecular glue happening in human cells uh, through therapeutic compounds. And of course, elegant studies from Nico Thomas' group and from Phil Chamberlain's group at Celgene, uh, they reported the how cerebellum works. Uh, they literally uh, re recapitulate the molecular glue mechanism as we showed for auxin, that they resurface the E3 ligase cerebellum uh, and then uh, allow together with the compound, the E3 ligase, to recognize glycine loop uh, from different neosubstrates. And these uh, uh, studies were later echoed by, I would say, almost a firework of discoveries uh, uh, of uh, indicilum uh, interacting with uh, or reprogramming DK15 to degrade RBM39, which I believe uh, James will talk about after me. And then uh, uh, other compounds like a CDK12 inhibitor that would actually allow uh, this uh, cycling, D, uh, cycling K, CDK12 complex to bypass DCAF directly glued to the DDB1 uh, substrate uh, receptor adapter proteins. And this really electrified the field and uh, raises the question that uh, can we actually prospectively discover target-centric molecular glue uh, as protein degraders? Uh, this slide echoes uh, what uh, uh, Michele already showed, and we're really fascinated by this burning question, how to come up with a rational approach to discover molecular glue degraders. Uh, early on, actually, even before EMIT uh, story come out, we have thought about it uh, quite uh, intensively, and then we come up with this uh, realization that perhaps uh, we could, uh, back then, this is without EMIT's uh, story, uh, we could actually uh, learn from auxin to do something like this, okay? is that we know uh, in human cells there are several E3 substrate pairs uh, whose either mutation or defects in post transitional modification would lead to disease state where substrate can no longer bind to E3 ligases. Um, can we actually learn from auxin to come up with small molecules that can repair or maybe uh, resurrect the interaction uh, in order to overcome the effect of mutation that weaken the interaction or maybe bypass the requirement of phosphorylation. Uh, perhaps that actually echoes uh, what uh, uh, Michele just talked about, the cyclin D complex, uh, cyclin D embryo complex, uh, to achieve uh, enhanced interaction between substrate and E3 ligases to accelerate ubiquination process. And I would say, actually, uh, if you read the literature, uh, Neurix did a fantastic job in this uh, arena, uh, targeting endogenous E3 substrate pairs, where they come up with a uh, synthetic compound, a Neurix compound, that can allow uh, hypophosphorylated beta catenin peptide with only one phosphate modifying the dagron uh, to gain high enough, if, if not even higher affinity, to the E3 ligase beta TRCP, uh, even though the monophosphorylated one itself has rather weak uh, affinity. So I think this is really a proof of concept 
that uh, we can, uh, using MedCam, to push or, or perfectionize a uh, small molecule so that it can achieve the effect of a covalently uh, linked phosphate group or any other amino acid. Um, so this is a one obvious direction that I think uh, we call a tier one, tier two program where we can exercise uh, the molecular glue concept. But really what's uh, more exciting and more promising is to think about how we can come up with chemical compounds that can foster new interactions between E3 legacies and, uh, oh, sorry, new, new interactions between E3 legacies and substrates that are not naturally degraded by the substrate, uh, by the E3 ligase. So we thought about this uh, after the EMIT story came out, and we really couldn't, uh, I would say, uh, figure out how to do this, because uh, this is completely uncharted territory. And uh, I would say early on, we had rather heroic, uh, crazy ideas of uh, uh, exploring the chemical space and uh, see whether we can come up with any compound that can foster interaction between any two proteins. Uh, maybe back then we were very optimistic, and that certainly wasted a lot of time. We had to actually really come down to earth and think about something that's based on science, not, but not just uh, enthusiasm. And uh, one day, actually, I just happened to talk to one of my colleagues, uh, Liang Tsai Gu, who is in the biochemistry department. And uh, he was trained by, in uh, George Church's lab, and back then, he was very interested in come up with uh, what's so-called dual nanobody chemical sensors. So basically the concept is, uh, uh, yes, uh, Baker's group can design, you know, bunders of uh, small molecules, but uh, would he be able to use uh, basically random screening uh, to look for nanobodies, uh, two nanobodies that can only interact with each other in the presence of a small molecule? Then you can use these nanobodies as sensors for that small molecule. And in this case, actually, he was focusing on cannabidiol, which is CBD, and uh, his approach is rather straightforward or very conceivable. Uh, he would actually immobilize the ligand first and then screen for uh, nanobody libraries uh, that contains many variants uh, because uh, they harbor random sequence in three loop regions, the complementarity, complementarity determining region and he would actually find, he, he, he was able to find actually, a nanobody variants that can bind to the ligand. He then immobilized this nanobody, the first uh, binder, and then he would screen that library again, ask whether he can find a dimerization binder uh, that would only interact with the first binder uh, in the presence of the small molecule, right? So that's actually a quite conceivable. Um, that he would be able to find something, and he did. He actually found many pairs of any small molecule. Uh, in this case, uh, he can find a pair that can, the, the two nanobody would interact with each other in the CBD dependent manner, and they wouldn't actually do it uh, in the presence of a close analog, THC, okay? Despite the high similarity between the two compounds. So, I was actually intrigued by his uh, presentation, and then I was stunned by the fact that his drawing of this two nanobody system, is so similar to the way me and Michele think about molecular glues. So I thought, wow, so in your case, you are probably really looking for the opposite, uh, uh, the, the answer of the opposite question is, uh, if you have a glue, can you find the two proteins that the glue can foster interaction, right? So it must be a glue system. Uh, he said, no, this is not a glue system, because in his mind, even though he draw it this way, he thought it must be an allosteric mechanism. That is, the nanobody upon binding to the ligand would undergo conformational changes so that the second nanobody can bind. Even though he draw it in this simple way, he wasn't thinking it's a glue. So we kind of a debate with each other back and forth and back and forth, and eventually he said, well, Ning, if you think it's a glue, you better reveal the mechanism by determining the structure. I was like, okay, then we have to determine the structure. So we will use an experimental approach to determine the structure of the system. And lo and behold, it's a glue. So uh, you can see that the crystal structure of this two nanobody together with CBD shows that the CBD is sandwiched in the middle just like the way he drew it and just like the way I draw it. And and then the, 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 the ligand is uh, interacting with 
both nanobodies very extensively. But in order to really understand the system, uh, we actually have to do some thermo thermodynamic measurement, right? Try to understand the binding events of the system. So uh, the advantage of this system, glue system, over other systems is that these nanobody proteins are very easy to purify. You can get bucket load of these proteins with, you know, with the rotation student, but literally, right? You don't need poor postdocs to solve this problem. So we actually uh, purified tons of these proteins, and then we did uh, binary interaction among these three molecules uh, for every pair. And consistent with the selection process that uh, Liang Cai's lab uh, used to find these uh, nanobodies, uh, the nanobody, uh, the, the small molecule CBD has measurable affinity to the first uh, ligand binder. Okay, this is the first binder he identified. And the affinity is two micromolar, so the affinity is not very, very high. And of course, uh, he didn't select for a second dimerization partner for binding the small molecule. So when we measure the interaction, there's no affinity whatsoever. And then, of course, in the presence of the small molecule, we can find very tight binding between the two nanobodies. This is all consistent with what he hypothesized. What's inconsistent with what's his uh, rationale is that because we were able to purify these proteins in large quantity, we actually were able to measure the affinity between these two nanobodies. Remember, in his screening process, he actually eliminated the second dimerization partner uh, if it doesn't have, uh, if it has affinity to the first uh, binder, right? He has a counter screen after selecting the, the, the second antibody that can bind to the first antibody in the presence of the ligand, he would have a counter screen to eliminate those that can bind without the ligand. But turns out that uh, his uh, counter screen selection process, he didn't use high enough uh, protein concentration. So he was measuring interaction at the five micromolar, and we were able to titrate it way up. So in fact, when we look at this uh, uh, interaction, uh, the, 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 the two nanobodies can interact with each other in the absence of the ligand. This actually is very highly consistent with the fact that the crystal structure show extensive protein-protein interface uh, outside the ligand binding pocket, okay? So this actually was very, very interesting because we, this was completely unexpected. If it's allosteric switch, of course, they would not have any interface. But in this case, we saw interface, and we think this is a glue system. And that triggered us to think back to say, hey, wait a second. The known molecular glues, do they do the same thing? Are we missing something because we didn't do this kind of thorough studies? By all means, back then, in 2007, when we studied the oxygen system, because the proteins are so difficult to purify, we didn't report any binding affinity whatsoever. We just report the structure. That was enough. But these days, of course, you have to report every parameter you can measure in order to publish uh, in the leading journal. So this triggered us to went back to the, to, to the, to the uh, drawing board and ask, is this phenomenon true for all known molecular glue systems? Lo and behold, when we obtained all these binding um, uh, numbers for other systems, for example, in tier one system, oxygen actually does have affinity to the E3 ligase, tier one, although the affinity is 13 micromolar. It has no affinity to the diagram peptide, oxide A peptide, that's expected, because the peptide doesn't have any binding pocket. Uh, when oxygen is present, of course, the peptide and the protein binds at 20 nanomolar. But what's interesting is that if you push the concentration of the peptide high enough, you can see endogenous basal interaction between the peptide and the E3 ligase, even the ox in the absence of auxin. This, literally all these numbers recapitulate what we found for the nanobody system. And then we ask, what about the cerebellum system? In the literature, people already know uh, the uh, uh, emid compound can bind to cerebellum with high affinity. And that's a rather unusual property of molecular glue. Uh, and that actually revolutionized protac because now all of a sudden you have a ligand that can bind to a E3 ligase, endogenous human E3 ligase. Uh, in their system, obviously the glue doesn't 
interact with the neural substrate because the glycine loop doesn't have a pocket. Uh, but we were able to measure the basal interaction between these neural substrates and cerebellum, even though these substrates are not the natural substrate of the E3 ligase. And what the small molecule does is to push these weak interactions into double-digit nanomolar range so that the interaction will become productive. The system I introduced you early on uh, studied by Nurex so where they find a small molecule that can allow beta-TRCP to gain high affinity to high polyphosphorylated beta-TRCP. In that system, actually the small molecule doesn't have any affinity to neither the E3 nor the background substrate. And, uh, but the reason they can do this is because the basal interaction is actually very strong between the high polyphosphorylated peptide and the E3 ligase. And of course, their compound was able to do a really miraculous job by pushing the affinity more than 1,000 fold. That's actually higher than the effect where the, the second phosphorylation side can achieve. That gives us the hope that small molecules should be able to uh, do the job just like these guys do to uh, enhance basal interaction. So based on this study, so Based on these studies, so we thought we should, we're in a unique position to kind of redefine molecular glue. We think molecular glues are very unique chemical inducers of proximity different from PROTAC uh, by not showing affinity to at least one of the protein components of the system. And second is uh, molecular glue's action relies on the basal interaction uh, in micromolar range between the substrate and E3 ligase, and the glue job is to push this interaction into nanomolar range. In other words, you convert non-productive uh, weak protein-protein interaction into productive uh, strong interaction. And here I want to further highlight what do I mean non-productive micromolar weak interaction. So in my mind, uh, these are what's so-called non-specific interactions. And if you say non-specific interactions, immediately it should ring the bell in your brain that, oh, there are sticky proteins that would bind to everything on, on this planet, right? Uh, that's one type of non-specific interaction. And in those type of non-specific interaction, your binding partners can actually associate with each other in all kinds of different forms. And your, 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 pot, your protein, probably because of its greasiness, can even stick to the surface of your test tube. That's the classic trashy, non-specific interaction that we want to avoid at all costs. But the non-specific interaction that can be glueable, in my mind, they are actually post-specific, non-specific interaction. Meaning that when the two proteins are non-specifically interacting with each other, even though the specificity um, is um, it's, so, so even though it's non-specific, there's still a specificity in terms of how the two proteins interact with each other. It just this type of interaction is very transient, very weak. That in the cell, because the concentration of these protein components are so low, the KD is irrelevant in, under physiological condition. Okay, and what we're going after are these type of interactions. And the key question is, of course, how to identify these interactions. Literally, for glue discovery, we think that uh, the burning question is to identify this, this type of micromolar post-specific, non-specific interactions. And then we want, to small, we want to come up with small molecules that can fill up the gap or maybe to uh, uh, resurface the E3 ligase or the substrate uh, so that the interaction can be enhanced by roughly 1,000 fold. Most proteins in human cells are expressed at a nanomolar concentration. So when we achieve this type of enhancement, we will make this non-productive interaction into a productive form. The advantage of molecular glue, again, echoing what uh, uh, Michele already said, is that your molecular glue doesn't have to have affinity to at least one of the proteins. And if you look outside the cerebellum uh, image system, actually exemplified by the auxin case, your molecular glue doesn't even have, have high affinity to the E3 ligase. Okay? The, the E3 ligase uh, binds to molecular glue also at the micromolar range. In the presence of a substrate, it would actually sequester the glue in the middle and 
make the binding or the potency of the molecule much higher. Okay, so that actually, we think, provides an anchoring point for us, or maybe a starting point for us to think about how to prospectively discover molecular glue, is to first address the question, which E3 ligase you should choose to match a target that hopefully has therapeutic value that already been demonstrated. So in this direction, we have uh, already mentioned by uh, Micheli and uh, Amram, we have more than 600 E3 ligases. That provides the opportunity for us to choose the right E3 ligases. Uh, but out of this shelf, it's like you walk into Walmart, you have too many choices. Which one you want? Well, you better use some filters to select, prioritize these E3 ligases. Uh, there are many factors, for example, tissue distribution, subcellular localization, um, whether we understand the E3s, uh, or if we don't understand the E3s, we might have high risk. All these factors, of course, and the drug ability, yeah. but we think a critical factor we should uh, uh, think about is the basal affinity. If we can select the E3 ligase that has the right basal affinity, then we'll have a much higher chance to find a glue that can enhance the interaction. And of course, uh, Michele also mentioned that the advantage of glue is that it doesn't have to show, doesn't have to display uh, high affinity to one of the binding partner at least. So that actually put it at a huge advantage of targeting non-ligandable or intrinsically disordered proteins, many of which are found in the neurodegenerative disease area. Okay, so obviously we made a very small step toward the rational approach. We say basal affinity perhaps is the critical factor we should consider. The next burning question is, how do you find this? Uh, if I have the answer, probably we don't have to have this meeting <laughs> to think about it. <laughs> so I think I would want to invite the audience to think about what are the approaches we can use to actually uh, discover this kind of basal affinity. And my gut feeling tells me maybe we can look into classic approaches, just like everyone is saying, biochemistry is one way to do this, uh, but we probably need um, expertise from other cutting edge field that's outside the degradation field. Uh, for example, proteomics, for example, computational approaches. Okay, we have to think kind of out of the box to figure out what is the most productive way to achieve this. Once we're there, the rest is just conventional small molecule discovery. Okay, with that, uh, I want to thank a long list of trainees and collaborators, and partic particularly biologists like Michele Pagano and Evren Hershko, who really set the stage for us to do structural biology, understand the basis of fundamental principles governing protein-protein interaction, uh, so that we can uh, come up with uh, therapeutic approaches, uh, taking advantage of these uh, fascinating uh, biological systems. And of course, uh, we really benefit tremendously from funding uh, from NIH uh, and uh, HHMI, and of course, close interactions with uh, SEED and uh, Eli Lilly and many other companies who are interested in this space. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>